وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In this episode inshallah ta'ala we want to look at how to teach your children Islam or perhaps we could more accurately say how to manage the teaching of your children Islam because in reality it might not be the case that the parent is able to teach their child directly depending on how much knowledge the parent has what stage the child is at how far the child is going to go in their learning and so on however it is still the parent's responsibility to ensure that the child gets that education it's still the child's right to receive that education so it's not enough for the parent to simply drop the child at the gates of the masjid or the madrasa and say that these people are going to take that responsibility from me and that's why in this episode inshallah it's not my intention to go through every last aspect of teaching your children islam but more to give you an overview of some important concepts and principles that will help you as a parent to if you like supervise arrange organize and participate in your children's islamic education and we're going to try to do this based upon the texts from the book of allah and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and from the athar the reports that are narrated and, and brought to us from the righteous predecessors those people who excelled in knowledge from the different generations so let us try to to kind of start by looking at the virtue and the value of knowledge and why it's important as a parent that you should give your child's islamic education the highest priority allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in surah al-mujadilah in ayah number 11 يا ايها الذين امنوا اذا قيل لكم تفسحوا في المجالس فافسحوا يفسح الله لكم واذا قيل انشزوا فانشزوا يرفع الله الذين امنوا منكم والذين اوتوا العلم درجات والله بما تعملون خبير O you who believe if it is said to you make space in the gatherings then make space and Allah azza wa jal will open things up for you Allah will make ease for you and if it's said to you stand up then stand up and Allah Azza wa Jal will raise those people who believe from among you and those who have been given knowledge darajat many levels and Allah is all aware of what you do so Allah Azza wa Jal here and the part of the ayah we wanted yarfa'illahu alladhina amanu minkum walladhina utul ilma darajat Allah will raise up those who believe among you. Allah Azza wa Jal will raise up those who believe among you and those who have been given knowledge many levels. So Allah Azza wa Jal promised a rifa'ah, He promised to raise up the status of the people who have been given knowledge. And that's something that should motivate us to gain knowledge for ourselves and our children. And we should remind everyone what we had said in a previous episode about the parent being an example for the child make us examples for the people of taqwa the parent has to be an example for the child but this should be something to motivate us that if we want ours the status of our children to be raised up in the sight of allah azza wa jal and for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise them up levels in this world and in the hereafter then the way and the means to achieve that is through al-ilm. And there is a principle, and this principle, to the best of my knowledge, it is a principle that is widely agreed upon among the scholars of Islam. And that is whenever al-ilm is mentioned in the sharia without any restrictions, then the ilm, the knowledge that is mentioned is al-ilm al-shari, the knowledge of the sharia and the knowledge of Islam. And it's not the knowledge of medicine, 
It's not the knowledge of science. It's not the knowledge of mathematics. It's not the knowledge of English or indeed of any other language. Rather, it is the knowledge of Islam and its sciences that raises a people up darajat, many levels in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here there's a very interesting point, which is that it's very rare that people are sincere towards other people, sincerely want good, except for those who Allah has had mercy upon. But one example where you consistently see, uh, even among people who might not be adhering to the religion in the way that they should be, we still see that generally the parent is one example where they truly want good for their children. Your parents, generally speaking, really genuinely want their children to succeed. And this ayah tells us that the means to success is al-iman and al-ilm. It is iman. It is faith that is comprised of beliefs and statements and actions. And it is al-ilm. It is knowledge. Allah Azza wa Jal told us in Surah Taha, فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ وَلَا تَعْجَلْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مِنْ قَابْلِ أَنْ يُقْضَى إِلَيْكَ وَحْيُهُ وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا So exalted is Allah and Malik Al-Haqq. And do not seek, O Messenger, to hasten the, the Qur'an before it is revealed to you. We know the Prophet ﷺ, he used to worry in the beginning about keeping the Qur'an and about whether he would be, how to convey the Qur'an. And Allah took that responsibility away from him. But Allah commanded him to say, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا My Lord, increase me in knowledge. If our Prophet was told to say that, and that was considered to be something fundamental to him that he needed, to make dua, to say, Allah, increase me in knowledge. Then indeed, this is something that all of us should be doing, should be encouraging our children to do, and we should be making dua for our children. Rabbi ziduhum ilma. O Allah, increase them in knowledge. Give them more knowledge and increase us in knowledge. Rabbi zidani ilma. My Lord, increase me in knowledge. And from the ahadith, that is from the most comprehensive and the most excellent of the hadith, among the most excellent of the hadith, regarding the virtue of knowledge and why we should be giving attention to our children's Islamic education, is what is narrated from Qais ibn Kathir, that he said, قَدِمَ رَجُلٌ مِنَ الْمَدِينَةِ عَلَىٰ أَبِي الدَّرْدَىٰ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ وَهُوَ بِدَمَشْقِ A man came from Medina to the noble companion Abu Darda while he was in Damascus. He came all the way from Medina to Damascus. فَقَالَ مَا أَقْدَمَكَ يَا أَخِي Abu Darda, he said to him, What made you come here, my brother? فَقَالَ حَدِيثٌ بَلَغَنِي أَنَّكَ تُحَدِّثُ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, I've come because of a hadith. And it's reached me that you are the one who is narrating this hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sahaba spread out all over the Islamic world at that time. And so the people who heard of this from the Tabi'een and the young Sahaba and so on, they would travel, they would, with great hardship, particularly from the Tabi'een and those after them, traveling from place to place to hear somebody who has this hadith from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abu Darda, he said to him, Qala ama li haja. He said, did you not come for something you needed? You know, yeah, you came for the hadith, but you, you know, you had maybe some trade in Damascus. You had something you needed and you came to ask me on the side. Qala la. He said, no. Qala ama qadimta li tijara. He said, haven't you come here for business? Qala la. He said, no. قَالَ مَا جِئْتَ إِلَّا فِي طَلَبِ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ He said, the only thing that brought you here is to ask about this one hadith. You came all the way from Medina to Damascus to ask me about one hadith. قَالَ فَإِنِّي سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَقُولِ 
He said, then I have heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam say, Man salaka tariqan yabtaghi fihi ilma salaka Allahu bihi tariqan ila al-jannah. Whoever sets out on a path in which he seeks knowledge, Allah takes him on a path to Jannah. In some of the different narrations, it's mentioned, Sahar Allahu lahu bihi tariqan ila al-jannah. Allah makes his path to Jannah easy. وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَتَضَعُوا أَجْنِحَتَهَا رِضًا لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ And the angels, they lower their wings out of pleasure for the student of knowledge. When the angels, they lower their wings, they lower their wings out of pleasure for what the student of knowledge is doing. SubhanAllah, can you think of any hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, you, it will be easy for you to go to Jannah. It will be easy for you to go to Jannah. Generally, Jannah is not associated with ease. Ala inna sil'at Allahi ghaliyah. The thing that Allah is selling to you is expensive. Ala inna sil'at Allahi jannah The thing that Allah is selling to you is Jannah. Subhanallah. Jannah is not easy. Jannah is expensive. Jannah is worth something. And yet in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ told us, that Allah, sahal Allah, Allah will make it easy for this person to go to Jannah. And Allah will take him on a path to Jannah. And that the angels lower their wings out of contentment. How content they are to see people seeking knowledge. Would you not want your child to be someone that the angels lower their wings for him or for her? Would you not want your child to be someone who it's easy for them to go to Jannah? Would that not be closer to benefiting you as a parent even? Either through the fact that you were the one to set them out on this path and you would have the reward because whoever guides a person towards good gets the reward of what that person gets without their reward being decreased in anything. So you as a parent would get the reward of that. And if you fell short as a parent, the hope that perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his grace and his mercy might make what you had given to that child and help that child a cause for you to enter paradise along with them. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued in this hadith, وَإِنَّ الْعَالِمَ لَيَسْتَغْفِرُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ حَتَّى الْحِيْتَانُ فِي الْمَاءِ That the scholar and there are narrations that mention the talib al but that most of the narrations they mention the scholar, that the scholar, everything in the heavens and the earth asks forgiveness for them, even the fish in the water. Even the fish in the water. The fish in the water ask Allah to forgive the scholar. Everything in the heavens and the earth is making dua for Allah to forgive the scholar. And in some of the narrations we said, it mentions the student of knowledge. Even when we say perhaps the scholar has the the have alpha, the, the big portion of this, but perhaps a portion of it comes to the student of knowledge. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. And the virtue of the scholar over the worshipper is like the virtue of the moon over all of the other heavenly bodies of all of the other things that are in the sky. Subhanallah. All of the other things, that how the moon stands out on the night when it's full, you can barely see the stars, the small stars. The moon stands out. That is the virtue of the scholar over all of the other worshippers. And notice here, the Prophet ﷺ is not differentiating between the scholar and the semi-practicing, you know, like 50-50 Jum'ah, Ramadan Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ is distinguishing between the scholar and the abid, the one who is worshipping Allah in the day and the night. He fasts in the day and he prays in the night. He salli fil layl wa yasumu fil nahar. He fasts in the day and he prays in the night and the scholar is so much better than him. Subhanallah. Over the abid, the worshipper who is dedicated to the worship of Allah. So how is the virtue of the scholar over the one who is not really practicing Islam or not really committed towards 
the religion of Islam and not really doing what they should be doing. If the virtue of the scholar over the worshipper who is dedicated to the worship of Allah is like the virtue of the, of the moon over everything else that is in the, in the heavens. إِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ إِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَمْ يُوَرِّثُوا دِينَارًا وَلَا دِرْهَمًا إِنَّمَا وَرَّثُوا الْعِلْمِ The scholars, they are the inheritors of the prophets. There's no prophet coming after the Prophet Muhammad So we know Isa السلام, he will come down as an ayah, as a sign. Not as a prophet, but as a sign from Allah جل, of the coming of the, the hour. There is no prophet coming after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who is it that took the job of the prophets and the role of the prophets and inherited that from them? The ulama, the scholars, they are the ones who inherited the prophets. Would you not want your son or your daughter to be someone who inherits the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the prophets generally, Alayhim Salatu Wasallam? The prophets didn't leave any dinar or any dirham behind. What they left behind was nothing but knowledge. فَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِهِ أَخَذَ بِحَظٍ وَافِرٍ So whoever takes this knowledge from them has taken a huge portion, a big portion. You talk about inheritance and money. You say, oh, how much did you get? Did you get a big portion or a small portion? If you took knowledge from the prophets, alayhim salatu wasalam, from our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you took the biggest portion of good and the biggest portion of, of excellence and of, of the most wonderful thing that you could have took, you took it if you took knowledge from the Prophets Alayhim Salatu Wasalam. Look at the virtue here. Look at the virtue. And that's why there's a narration from Abi Huraira radiallahu anh, that he one, once went into the marketplace one day and he saw all the businessmen, the traders, and they were trying to trade and trying to, you know, each one is trying to, to, to make his money for the day. And that he mentioned Abu Huraira that the inheritance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was being shared out in the masjid. And of course the traders, they thought that, you know, maybe the bowl of the Prophet Sallallahu maybe his cutlery, maybe uh, some of his clothing was being distributed in the masjid. So they ran to the masjid thinking that if I can get a portion of this. And when they went into the masjid, they just saw somebody reading the Quran and somebody studying the rules of Islam and the laws of Islam, they just saw people studying knowledge. And they came back and they said so to Abu Huraira, that oh, Abu Huraira, we, we didn't see in the masjid the inheritance being divided. He said, what did you see? And they, they talked to him, so some people studying the Quran and some people were, you know, learning knowledge and some people were, you know, they were revising and, and what have you. Abu Huraira said, this was the inheritance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what the Prophet ﷺ left behind. And if only you would rush to that the way you would rush to your business and your wealth and your money and your opportunities for trade and increase, subhanAllah, a person would take a hadh, they would take a hadh a huge portion, a huge reward from this. Isn't that what we would love to have for our children? Bearing in mind what I said, that the person who guides a person and the person who sets a person out on that path is like the one who did it and gets the reward of the one who did it. So you as a parent, imagine you have three children or two children, or four children. Imagine that every one of them, you set them out on that path. Imagine the reward that you get as a parent for setting your children out upon that path. And we have to understand that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. And so it's an obligation upon our children. And therefore, as parents who are responsible for our children, it is an obligation upon us and a right that they have over us that we give them that obligatory knowledge. And that's why there is a hadith from Anas ibn Malik from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he said, طلب العلم فريضة على كل Muslim. The hadith narrated by Ibn Majah and others. Uh, and this hadith is a hadith which the scholars differed over its authenticity and its weakness. There are many among the scholars who said this hadith is authentic. And they said the reason it's authentic is because it came from so many different chains and different narrations that they reached the level of it being fair or authentic. Others among them, they said, this hadith is not authentic. 
However, those who said the hadith is not authentic, like the greatest Imam, uh, Ishaq ibn Rahway, he said, Rahimahullah ta'ala lam yasih. He said, this hadith is not authentic. He said, illa, except. He said, except that the meaning of it, it is authentic. So even those scholars who didn't accept the authenticity of this hadith, they agreed unanimously that the meaning of it is authentic. And many among them said the hadith is authentic as well. Talabul ilm fariidatun ala kulli muslim. Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every single Muslim. Every single Muslim, every one of our children, it is obligatory upon them and it's obligatory upon you to seek knowledge. However, this leads us to a question or a problem. And that is that, how can it be that, that seeking knowledge is an obligation? How do we understand that in the right way? Because it wouldn't that indicate that if our, our children are not all tulabul ilm, they're not all students of knowledge, then we are sinful as parents. Does that not indicate that if we are not students of knowledge, we are sinful? Does that not indicate if our children are not studying Islam actively and memorizing the Quran and the Hadith and studying from the scholars that, our, that we as parents have failed in our duty to our children? In reality here, we have to distinguish between two types of knowledge of Islam. And this is the first thing that I would like to share with you as it relates to the important and fundamental principles that you have to take as a parent and your child's Islamic education. And that is that there are two types of Islamic knowledge. There is a type of Islamic knowledge that is fardu'ain. It is an obligation upon everyone. Every Muslim, every one of us who is watching this video, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about, you know, the parent, the child, all of you, it is fard upon you to get this knowledge. Now, with regard to the children, we say, well, the fard happens at puberty, right? That the fard becomes, they become sinful. But we established a principle already that the child has to be given what they need to fulfill their obligations before the time for those obligations come. Like the fact that we command our children to pray from seven years old and we discipline them if they don't pray at 10 years old, even though the prayer doesn't become sinful leaving the prayer until they reach puberty. So likewise here, it is fardu'ain upon every single Muslim, male, female, Whatever age they might be, it is fardu'ain upon them to seek knowledge. However, what is the knowledge that is fardu'ain? And what is the knowledge that is fardu kifaya? The knowledge that is a collective obligation. And what does it even mean for this knowledge to be a collective obligation? What does the word collective obligation actually mean? The word collective obligation, what it means is that it is an obligation for some, for enough people to do this job for the need to be fulfilled. And if there aren't enough people to do this job and the need is not being fulfilled, then everybody is sinful. Everyone is sinful. But if there are enough people doing the job and the need is fulfilled, then they, their, their work and their efforts suffice the rest of the people. It's not an obligation upon the rest of the people. So we said that knowledge of Islam and Islamic knowledge can be divided into these two categories. A category that is fardu ain, and a category that is fardu kifaya. A category that is an individual obligation, meaning that you have to give this to every single one of your children. And of course, in a way that is age appropriate and so on, according to their age and ability, but every one of your children, it is a right that they have over you. And you as a parent will be asked that every one of your children got this knowledge that is fardu'ain. Just like you'll be asked whether you had that knowledge. Every one of you, the husband, the wife, every one of you will be asked about that knowledge that is fardu'ain, that is a individual obligation. As for the knowledge which is fardu kifaya, a collective obligation, then this one is a bit more nuanced. 
So not everyone will be able to do this. And that's why it's fardu kifaya, because Allah Azawajal in His wisdom has made it such that because not everybody will be able to do that aspect, that second aspect. But that second aspect, it might be the situation and indeed it could easily be argued that in our time, in our situation, it is the case that actually we don't have enough scholars. We don't have enough students of knowledge. We don't have enough people calling to Allah Azza wa Jal according to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what the companions were upon and those who followed them in good. We don't have enough people doing that. And if it's the case that you feel watching this video that we don't have enough people doing that, then it becomes an obligation upon all of us to contribute towards that effort. To contribute whether it be one of our children or more of our children, that we see that there's a need, just like the wife of Imran, she saw there was a need. And she said, Inni nadartu laka ma fi batani muharraran fataqabbal minni. I have sworn to you, O Allah, that what is in my womb, I will give that child in service to you. SubhanAllah, she saw there was a need and she fulfilled that need. If you believe that there are not enough people calling to Allah, and you believe that more people are needed, then you have to step up and take that responsibility as well. So it may be that a fard kifaya becomes fardu ain. How can it be that a collective obligation becomes an individual obligation if there is no one else who is standing up for it, no one else who is doing it, and no one else that can, can take that collective obligation except a particular person, then it becomes obligatory upon them as an individual obligation as well. So let's go back to the knowledge that is fardu ayn, because this one is more important to begin with. And then we can inshallah cover the knowledge which is fardu kifaya, which is voluntary or which is a collective obligation. In other words, at least a minimum number of people have to do it to fulfill the need and get the job done. And if the job is not being done and not being done in, in a way that is good enough and satisfactory enough, then all of us are sinful and all of us are to blame. So let's talk about the knowledge that is fardu ayn, an individual obligation. Perhaps, and, and the scholars differ over their ibarat, the way they explain this type of knowledge. But wallah, from the best of the explanations that I have seen in this, is to explain this knowledge in the context of the hadith of Jibreel. Because the hadith of Jibreel, which is the hadith that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma narrated from his father Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, which covers the five pillars of Islam and it covers the six pillars of Iman. So it covers the five pillars of Islam, that is to testify there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, to perform the prayer, to give the zakah, to fast in the month of Ramadan and to make hajj for those who are able to do so. And then you have the six pillars of Iman, that you believe in Allah and His angels, His messengers, His scripture. And you believe in the last day and you believe in the divine decree, the good of it and the bad of it. And the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ told us about Ihsan. He told us what it means to perfect your worship and to reach the highest level of worship. That you worship Allah as though you can see Him and even though you can't see Him, you know that He sees you. In this hadith, at the end of the very, very end of the hadith, in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, he said to Umar ibn al-Khattab, about, he asked him, did you know who that person was? And Umar, he replied, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. He said, Allah and his messenger know best. Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, and Allah Azza wa Jal gave revelation to the Prophet وسلم, about it, so Allah and his messenger know best. Then he said, فَإِنَّهُ جِبْرِيلُ أَتَاكُمْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ He said, this was Jibreel, and he came to you to teach you your religion. Look at the way the Prophet ﷺ described these fundamental points as دِينُكُمْ Your religion. This is your religion. This is Islam in a nutshell. And therefore, I think that generally speaking, for us to say that the hadith of Jibreel maybe not exclusively, but as a base, represents the knowledge which is fardu'ayn upon every Muslim, 
that is inshallah and that is a, a strong uh, and a good explanation of what is obligatory upon every Muslim and we can add to it something additional because we have to add one additional piece of information to the hadith of Jibreel and many of the scholars as we said they, they had different ibarat, different explanations of the knowledge that is obligatory upon every Muslim however generally speaking if you look at the knowledge they put forward if you look at the suggestions and the examples almost all of them fall within the hadith of Jibreel however there is one more thing we need to add and that is the knowledge which relates to your current circumstances and which you need in your current circumstances and that is because knowledge must always precede action and Imam al-Bukhari Rahimahullah ta'ala in his sahih he took a chapter that knowledge precedes statement and action and in it he gave the evidence of the ayah in which Allah Azza wa said فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ Know that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and then seek forgiveness for your sins so knowledge preceded the istighfar it preceded seeking forgiveness the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded first to have the knowledge and then to seek the forgiveness so if we understand that there are all of us have different situations in our life for example one of us is about to get married before they get married they need the knowledge of the rights of the husband the rights of the wife and so on one of us is about to have a child before that child is born we need to know the rights of the child and the responsibilities and obligations of the parent and so on so if we were to say and Allah is which knows best this is just my sort of way of simplifying it and, and my kind of way of summarizing what I read from the people of knowledge on this topic is that if we were to say that the knowledge that is fardu ayn upon every Muslim is that which is contained in the hadith of Jibreel in addition to in addition to what is specific to each person's circumstances then I think that this is a good way of explaining it so what is found within the hadith of Jibreel is a tawheed that is the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal alone which is summarized for us by the shahadatain ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah to know what it means to understand its conditions and its rules to understand how to implement it in their lives to know how to pray to know how to give the zakah again according to the person's circumstances so it's not necessary for them to know all of the masail of zakah the individual issues in zakah but they should know what is the basic obligation of zakah the basic things that zakah is due upon in a general sense and then what is specific to their circumstances how to fast and then how to perform the hajj at least before they go to the hajj and the umrah they know that there is a hajj that is obligatory upon them and they know a little bit about it and then before they go they get more of the details in that and then as it relates to iman that they know Allah and they know the angels they know the messengers and the scripture they know the, the last day the belief in the last day and the belief in the divine decree the good of it and the bad again when we talk about what is obligatory upon every Muslim in a general sense we're not saying necessarily the individual masail in it like for example someone says okay is it obligatory in a matter of uh, to know the maratib of al-qadr to know the different stages of qadr we might say that the, the individual issues there like the stages of qadr and how each one builds upon the other that might not be fardu ayn that might not be from the things that are obligatory but to generally understand the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal and to understand that means that we have to work hard and put our trust in, our, in Allah and that we need Him that is from the obligations upon every Muslim so I think if you were to say the, the knowledge contained within the hadith of Jibreel in addition to what is specific to a person's circumstances that is before they get married they learn the rulings of marriage before they you know for example go to Umrah they learn how to perform Umrah before they start trading in business they learn what is halal and haram as it relates to their circumstances then I think this is what is obligatory upon every single Muslim so that's what Allah Azza wa made easy for me to mention in this episode there will be a second part inshallah ta'ala coming up uh, in the next episode where we're going to go on to talk a little bit more about this and to talk about the knowledge which is Fardu Kifaya which is a collective obligation uh, which 
we have to be careful that, that enough people are doing it to get the job done. And inshallah, we're going to talk more about principles and things that are essential as it relates to your children's education. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Was salatu was salam. Ala Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amau at home.com.